All right, so, um, hello. Uh, I am going to talk about being awesome by being boring today because nobody really expressed preference, so this is the one I'm doing because I already had slides for it. Um, I did do a circuit breaker talk as a lightning talk as well, so I can talk about that after Matt does his. Um, but for now, let's be boring. Um, so we're going to talk about a whole lot of stuff about like why I like being boring and what are the advantages and things like that. But first things first, hello, my name is John, and I am a crusty old Unix curmudgeon. Uh, I used to be a systems administrator back in the day, and I feel strongly that boring technology is the best technology. Because as we sysadmins, ex sysadmins in my case used to say, standard is better than better. And there's a lot of reasons for that. First off, it's stable. It's just going to work. You put it in, it works. Uh, everybody else on your team is going to know how it works. They're going to be able to use it without a lot of friction really easily for whatever it is that you're using it for. The standard technologies are usually going to be pretty easy to hire for. In fact, you, you probably already have hired for them. If you hire a bunch of Ruby developers, you kind of get a bunch of Rails developers for free in most cases. Uh, if you're doing some homegrown thing, then that's a lot harder to find. When you run into difficulties with it, it's easy to Google for the solutions to those problems because other people have already run into them first. In fact, other people have probably already fixed them first. You're not going to run into that many difficulties. Uh, see above. It's stable. Everything else in your environment is going to assume that things are going to work the way the default technologies work. They're going to work the way standards work. If you use Postfix as your mail server, everything else that relies on your mail server is just going to work because Postfix is the standard. If you're using some crazy old thing like, like QMail or some brand new spanking thing, who knows? It's, you never know. It might work, it might not. And basically, the bottom line to all of this is that it just works. If you go with the standard default technology stack, nine times out of ten, you can just drop it in and it's going to sit there being boring, being stable, being productive, and being awesome more or less forever. I'm not saying no maintenance will ever be necessary, but orders of magnitude less. On the flip side of that, it's easy to get uh, kind of lured in by exciting new technologies, but you should try not to assume that they're going to solve all of your problems. They may solve some, but I can just about guarantee you they're bringing their own problems with them that you don't know about yet. Um, but I can assure you those bad sides do exist, and there are a few that you can count on. Like, no one else around you is going to know how this thing works. And I don't just mean, like, the obvious stuff, like, what is this and how does it work under the hood, but even just basic APIs and usage patterns, no one's going to be familiar with that. And once they get familiar with it, they might change. Brand new technologies are notoriously unstable, even in, like, basic APIs. We had that problem here when we were doing a bunch of Docker infrastructure. APIs just changed halfway through. We had to rewrite a bunch of stuff, and then we had to rewrite it again when it changed the next time. That keeps happening. There's not going to be a lot of standard usage patterns. And I'm talking about things like, what are things named? And what, what directories do they go in? <laughs> what are the methods called? Right? You're going to have to get everybody to agree on that stuff. And that can take a lot of time and effort and discussion that you could be spending actually building stuff instead. The tooling is not going to be there. If you're lucky, it won't be there. If you're unlucky, it will be there and it will be terrible. Um, <laughs> If you go with something standard like, say, HTTP as a, as, a, as a protocol for communication, you're going to get curl. It just exists. It's already there. You get a million HTTP client libs to choose from. You can point your browser at an endpoint and see how it works. All of that infrastructure already is out there. You don't have to write any of it. It's just, just there. From a security perspective, a lot of the low-hanging fruit of vulnerabilities is still going to exist in a new technology that hasn't had as many security-savvy eyeballs looking at the code. Older stuff has been around more, uh, all the vulnerabilities, have, not all, but more of them are going to have been found and processed and fixed than exciting new things will, which is really just a subset of the general trend that's going to have more bugs, it's going to have more rough edges, and maybe worst of all, it might be Mongo. <laughs> Now, I don't, I don't want to be unfair. Like, Mongo is actually really good for a specific, very specific set of use cases, but that's a very well-defined and fairly narrow set of circumstances where it works well. And it was initially used much more broadly than that. People would just jam it in because it was new and shiny uh, in places where it was really, really terribly suited. And this killed a lot of projects, a lot of open source projects, and I'm sure a lot of commercial behind-the-scenes projects that we just never heard about, uh, because eventually those projects would find out, like, oh, gosh, our data is actually really fundamentally relational. It, it, just, it just fits more in a tabular form, and 
maybe there are relationships between different models that don't nest well, or maybe don't nest at all, and you have to switch. You, you can't continue with that technology anymore. And that just kills a lot of projects that couldn't make it. Even the ones that did successfully transition, they paid a huge cost in doing so. Uh, whereas if they'd just gone with Postgres out of the gate, like, no problem. It was work most of the time. All that said, I, I think there are some reasons where it does make sense to use something a little newer uh, and a little less well understood. Uh, and the biggest consideration when you're thinking of doing this is the context. Like, it really, really matters. Like, what, what, what is the situation that I'm thinking about putting this technology into? Um, you can think of it as like a spectrum, right? And, uh, and, it, and at one end, at the far shiny end, we have your personal side projects. This is the stuff that you're just doing for fun on your own time. Uh, like, go nuts. Just do whatever. Jam anything you want in there. In fact, I encourage you to do so. I think you should play with all the new stuff that you can on your, on your own projects. The stuff that it doesn't really matter if it doesn't work or if it takes an extra three months. Like, whatever. It doesn't matter. Because you're going to learn a lot of new stuff. You're going to be exposed to a lot of new approaches to doing things. And you're going to be able to take a lot of those insights back to your day job and just into your life in general. And you're going to be an engineer, a better engineer for it. While you're playing with these new technologies, I would encourage you to push them farther than you think you need to necessarily just to solve your problem. And make sure that it does, in fact, solve the problem that you think it does. Think about how you would test this technology if you were going to use it like at a day job. Uh, and think about how you would monitor it. Maybe most importantly, remember as you're playing with this stuff that if you try to use this in a, in a production environment with other people, with a real team, you're going to be an advocate for this technology and you're going to be a teacher. You're going to have to explain it to other people and convince them that it's a good idea. So prepare yourself for that while you're working with this stuff. So moving to sort of the, the middle area, you could think of like internal tools. And this would be something like an employee directory. Here at New Relic, we call ours our people. And, and by the way, I love our people, both the app and our actual people. They're awesome. Um, and internal tooling like that is a great way to sort of dip your toe in, uh, as the next slide says, uh, to sort of dip your toe in and, and kind of just see how it plays out. Just like think about like how does this deploy? Does it actually fit into the infrastructure that you've got in your office? Um, and, and think about maybe explicitly making this just a trial thing. These sort of tools are usually pretty lightweight. And, and you want to be kind of agile about it. You want to be prepared. Like, if it doesn't work out, oh, OK, that experiment didn't work. Just throw it out and rewrite it from scratch using more standard technology, um, which often is the thing that you do every so often with your little side tools anyway. Uh, bear in mind, you don't want to go too nuts in this environment because people are going to have to use this and maintain it. So like you're inflicting whatever you write on your coworkers to have to deal with later. But, but I think it's totally appropriate to, to, to try rolling stuff out initially in, in something like this. But when you move to the far, far conservative end of the spectrum, this is code that people have paid you to write that is going to directly affect the bottom line of your company. Then you really need to be careful about what you build it on. Uh, and specifically, I think you need to have a, a very specific problem that you're trying to solve. Because again, people are going to have to maintain this after you go. It's got to it's got to actually work, and that means you need a very good reason to deviate from standard technology choices. And one thing that I, I hear every so often people say is that oh, I, I think this other thing is a better fit. Uh, this this new thing, whatever. Oh, the, the data model just fits better for Redis or something. And I don't I don't think that's a good enough reason. Uh, if somebody says that, I, I encourage you to challenge them on it. Uh, and if you're tempted to say it, I, I think you should think a little harder about what you mean by that. Like, what is it that doesn't fit? What actual problem is the standard technology creating that you can solve? And if you do that, you're going to have a much more compelling argument for using the new thing when you come and try to convince your coworkers, especially if they're cranky old curmudgeons like myself, uh, to use the new thing. And if you can't come up with anything other than a fit, Maybe that's a sign you should just stick with the standard. So what are some more specific scenarios where, where you would want a, a new technology? What are some compelling reasons? Well, one is that if, if you just don't have, there is no boring solution to your problem. Um, and the example that I like to use for this, uh, I used to work at a company that would examine network traffic for signs of malicious behavior. Uh, and one of our clients was Comcast. As you might imagine, that is a very large number of network events that we had to trawl through. And we had a, a basic Postgres solution. 
which was great when we started, but eventually it just could not keep up. So we ended up rolling a, a, a Hadoop infrastructure, and we paid the price for that. Like this was, uh, I originally wrote this talk about a year ago. Hadoop's a little more boring, a little more acceptable now, but at the time it was more cutting edge, and when we did this, it was much more cutting edge years ago. Um, we had to write a lot of infrastructure on top of it. We ended up writing a simple little query language to do it. It took months to get this stuff actually working. But at the end of the day, we could do stuff with it we didn't have any way to do before that. Like We just couldn't use a standard technology. So that's, that's a good reason. Other times, the new thing is just so much better, like so much better than whatever is currently out there that it's worth it, even with the risk, even with the downsides. My favorite example of this is Rails. And uh, I know that Rails is your grandpa's framework now. It's really, really old and boring. But there was a time when it was the exciting new kid on the block. Uh, I, I meant that as a compliment. Uh, and I was an early-ish adopter of Rails, despite my, my conservative nature in this regard. Um, back in like the early 2000s, 1.x time frame. And, and the reason is that the other stuff available at the time was like struts or, or things like that, which were just, just really unpleasant to work with. And you, you could develop new applications so much faster with Rails, um, and I, I was so much happier doing it, that the trade-offs were worthwhile. So if you've decided in a given situation that it's worth going with something new, um, what are some ways that we can kind of mitigate the damage? What are some strategies to, to handle this? I think the most important one is to roll it out slowly. You don't want to rewrite the world all at once with a huge big bang if you can, if you can avoid it. Um, try to do it kind of piece by piece and have a, have a rollback plan in, 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 in place for each step so that if it doesn't work out, you can go back to what was there before. Uh, provide some guidance to your organization around usage. Um, this is again what I was talking about earlier with like what are things named, what are the directories that they go and stuff like that. Um, you want to get everybody on the same page about how that's going to work, so write some documentation about that. Uh, maybe make some tools if you can to, to like spin up a new whatever. We're doing that here uh, with the project called Nitro, but it, it just spins up a new service with all the stuff in the place where we want it and, it, and it, it'll just work. Um, and so you want to kind of you want to kind of do that kind of thing if you can. Uh, this slide is born of a very painful personal experience. Um, I, I, I have made this mistake. Uh, in my particular case, I once used solar indices to replace a, a roll-up table in my database because uh, it was sort of oh, it's a summary of the. Day. It seemed like a brilliant idea at the time. <laughs> uh, it was really 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 bad until we finally just had to rip the whole thing out. Um, and the underlying mistake that I made is that I was using this technology in a way that the creators hadn't expected and that nobody else was doing. And when you do that, you're just, you're going to have a bad time. You're multiplying all the downsides of using a new exciting technology by 10 because there's no way that anyone is going to have run into the problems that you're running into with this. And speaking of problems, they, they don't add up. Problems multiply. If you roll out more than one exciting new technology at a time, you, they're just going to compound each other. Um, if you already know all the quirks and problems of your existing environment and your existing framework, then it's going to be a lot easier narrowing down what's going wrong with the new stuff. And, and exciting new technologies do a lot better when they're in a boring context because the assumptions about how everything else around them works are actually going to hold true. Rarely you might see like two things that are designed to go together, and that might be an exception, but generally speaking, you're going to be much better off Putting, putting your shiny, new, unstable thing in as boring uh, a, an existing stack as you can get away with. So enough of all this hand wavy principles and blah, 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 I'm going to lecture you. Let's talk about actual real world, not actually real world, examples of decision making in, in, in action. Um, some of these we're going to zip through pretty fast and others we're going to explore in more detail. Uh, and before we get started, I want to just let you know that these are my opinions. And I didn't just make them up completely out of thin air. Uh, but reasonable and intelligent people could disagree with a lot of what I'm about to tell you, uh, and many have. Um, so with that out of the way, let's talk about our next generation multi-homed cloud-based potato storage solution, taterbases.com. I, I got that joke from uh, Aaron Patterson, so credit, do credit to him. Uh, and also, by the way, that website doesn't exist, but I encourage you to type it into your browser. Soon. So taterbases.com is obviously serious business. Uh, like I said, context matters. So we're going to assume that this is, this is your business. This is how you and your family and your coworkers' families are all earning their living. 
and we're going to treat the decisions around it accordingly. So let's get started. First decision, obviously out of the gate, is we have to pick a programming language that we're going to write this new web application in. And I think most people here probably have a pretty good sense for what the, uh, the obvious solution is to what to write a web app in. Perl. No. <laughs> Swift. No, Ruby. <laughs> uh, and in all seriousness, Ruby is actually plenty boring. It's, uh, my note here says it's almost 20 years old now, but it, actually it's over 20 years old now. Um, so it's a pretty boring solution, which means awesome. Uh, there's other options you could also choose. They're all perfectly reasonable. Uh, though if you don't want to write a web app in Java, I wouldn't hold it against you personally. Um, and, and there are reasons why you might want to use something else, um, obviously personal preference. Uh, but aside from that, sometimes your hand is forced. Like for example, if it needs to run in a browser, you're going to write it in JavaScript. Uh, maybe CoffeeScript, I guess. Um, there are some other things that you could use, and I actually, I should change this slide, because I think Go is probably okay now. I, I first gave this talk a year ago, and in that time I think Go has kind of crossed the line over to just barely stable enough that ah, it's probably fine. Go ahead. Um, other stuff, maybe not so much. So we know we're writing in Ruby, we can start writing some code, but we need to store our potato data, which brings us to our second decision. What database are we going to use? <laughs> and uh, there's an old saying about databases. Just use Postgres. <laughs> uh, or maybe MySQL if you must. Or if you really like setting large piles of money on fire, you could go with Oracle. Uh, but the main point is that you just want to use a standard relational database 99.9% .9 of the time. There are a few situations where I would go with a different option. Uh, one of them, like we already kind of discussed a little bit, if you have giant data sets, and you can't keep up with your input. In other words, you, you, you're so big your data is that your Postgres just can't keep up with it. And it also fits well into MapReduce. So it's probably some sort of aggregation functions that can be parallelized easily, uh, statistical analysis, that sort of thing. Hadoop is a good option, like we kind of already discussed. Uh, another scenario, though, maybe your read operations are too slow. And I want to pause here and talk about the phrase too slow. Uh, you need to have an actual reason why you need them to be faster. Like I said, a real problem that you're actually solving. But to be fair, uh, page loads are slow on a public-facing commercial website is a pretty valid reason. Amazon has done some studies, and for every like 100 milliseconds, you lose 1% of your sales. So that's a lot of money, potentially. That, that's pretty valid. But make sure you measure it, and you know you have a problem, and that this will fix it. <coughs> So your read operations are too slow, or some value of too slow. And your data is mostly going to fit into memory. Um, and you're only really using simple data structures, uh, hashes, arrays, just simple scalars, that sort of thing. Uh, Redis is a pretty good option to go with instead of Postgres in that situation. Uh, and uh, additionally, if you're using something like Rescue or Sidekick, hey Mike, um, then uh, you kind of already have it around, so you might as well go ahead and use it. You're not going to have to worry about like, oh, do I, how do I deploy this thing and maintain it, whatever. You already have to worry about that stuff, so go ahead. Uh, another scenario, maybe your write operations are too slow. Again, for some actual problem value of too slow. And you have like really big data sets, like vast tracts of data, huge <laughs> multiple data centers, big data sets. And uh, you also have enough money to employ a full-time DB hacker. Uh, Cassandra is a way to go with that. And I'm a little bit being unfair here. You don't technically need to have a full-time Cassandra hacker. But most companies I know that use Cassandra successfully for very large data sets definitely have one. So that aside, back to our databases. We have a language. We have a database. We start writing some code, but you still got to get this guy on the internet. So decision three. <laughs> Uh, how are we going to deploy this? What is this actually going to run on? And uh, I'm going to be honest, there are a lot of good reasons to use something newer than the boring option. Because the boring option is to build your own server, but you're going to want a sysadmin for that. Um, in the long run, I think it's more versatile and a heck of a lot cheaper to build your own servers, uh, unless you count the cost of a good sysadmin, because they are not cheap, uh, not the good ones. Um, so when do you use something else? The, the, most of the time, almost always. Uh, for example, you don't have a sysadmin, and you don't have huge performance needs yet. And maybe you like awesome stuff. Uh, <laughs> Heroku is a good way to go. Uh, it's really easy to use. It's easy to migrate off of later. For a small shop just getting started, it's great. A lot of people would say that Heroku is the boring option these days, I think. 
Um, there's other ways you could go as well, uh, AWS stuff, there's all kinds of virtualizations, container systems like Docker. All of that is going to need someone who really knows what they're doing to deploy it, so just get those professional people who do this for a living to do it for you. Um, but let's assume Heroku or whatever. We have databases.com, it's out there, it's up, it's running. We're starting to add more code, we're adding a whole lot of code. There's just stuff everywhere, it's just like getting kind of actually really hairy, which is gross, because hairy potatoes, no. So we gotta break this up. We're splitting it up into services now. And that raises a whole new set of questions. For example, how do these services actually talk to each other? And I'm just gonna let you know right now that I have opinions about this. Uh, the boring option, the correct option, dare I say, is to use Rails-style RESTful JSON over HTTP. There's actually, yes. <laughs> Uh, there are so many reasons why this is a good idea. Like, we already discussed a little bit. There are so much stuff there for you already. You already have curl, all those client libs, browsers, server-side Rails stuff has so much built in. If you don't want the whole Rails stack, you could go with something like Grape. There is a ton, a ton of stuff to make this really easy to write. And HTTP as a protocol has a ton of stuff just built right into the protocol. You get caching, just, it's just there. It just automatically happens. You get a ton of load balancing options. There are so many load balancers that handle HTTP. You want encryption? SSL, HTTPS, it's already there. If you're gonna expose any of these APIs to customers, they can consume JSON over HTTP, almost all of them. You are not gonna have to write them a client library. There's reasons you might want to, but you won't have to. You can kick that down the road, and good odds, you won't ever have to do it. Uh, not to mention, if you have any of this fancy front-end JavaScript stuff, you're pretty much going to have to write JSON endpoints. Uh, it's your only option. Until someone writes a thrift client in JavaScript, which, whew, nope. Uh, <laughs> side note here, and this, this actually, again, when I wrote this, it was a year ago. I, I think this is still true, but it might not be. Uh, if you're using Angular for the front-end, I would recommend using the, rest, the Rails conventions for your REST operations with the basic CRUD. It's pretty easy to get Angular to do that. Uh, if you're using Ember, it's not so easy. Uh, it wasn't. A year ago, it wasn't. Uh, I don't know why this didn't just work out of the box. It seems like it ought to. You hit a cat, so I don't know. But uh, uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't. And it's easier just to get Rails to speak the Ember style CRUD operations. So, uh, but, all right. So there are occasionally reasons where you have legitimate um, needs to use something other than JSON over HTTP. For example, maybe you like really, really, really need some high performance. <sighs> but before you go down this road, you want to make sure that this is actually your bottleneck. Like, look at your active record logs. Like, see how long your database stuff is working. Maybe, maybe throw active record out and just do the database queries directly. Uh, consider caching, like, everywhere. Just cache everywhere, everything. Uh, you, you can shave a few milliseconds off, maybe, by going to something other than JSON and HTTP. But I mean like a few milliseconds. You're not gonna get much. If you're not down to like 10 to 15 milliseconds, don't do this, don't bother. This is like one of the last things I would ever optimize. But maybe you're there. Maybe you're at seven to 10 milliseconds. You, you gotta get to five, five millisecond response time. Okay. Provide a protocol buffer version of your performance critical endpoints, but only your performance critical endpoints. You got your fire hose over here that feeds data over here. You wire that up, your client and your server, with just that one endpoint and leave the rest of it alone. Leave the rest of it JSON over HTTP. Because you think of it this way. You definitely are going to have some JSON HTTP endpoints because you have JavaScript, right? So it's going to be consuming JSON HTTP. And we have posited that you have this, at the other end of the spectrum, this one thing that really has got to be a protocol buffer or something, JSON HTTP, which won't cut it. But there's all this gray area in the middle that could go either way. I urge you. Go JSON HTTP with all the gray area. Everything that doesn't have to be something else. For all the reasons that I just discussed, you will save yourself a huge amount of headache. And uh, another point, actually make sure to benchmark this stuff. Actually test it and make sure you really do save that time. Fun fact, uh, OJ will often run faster than uh, proto buffs in Ruby because OJ, which is a, uh, a JSON uh, serializer and deserializer, is uh, compiled. Whereas the only protobuf library the last time I looked was pure Ruby. So the OJ was actually faster. So benchmark, make sure it really is gonna improve your situation before you commit to something other than HTTP JSON. Uh, so carrying this even farther, maybe you just like, five milliseconds is too much milliseconds. You need like 
two <laughs> or three. And also, you've removed the portion of your ba brain responsible for fear. <laughs> <coughs> you can do this too. Uh, so maybe, maybe you could roll your own with zero MQ. And zero MQ is basically a super hyper mega lightweight um, uh, messaging protocol with some Ruby implementations and others. And, and it gets so crazy fast by doing nothing, like nothing. <laughs> There's no features on it except I send a message there. Um, and that, that's the only way it can be that fast. So if you're going to use this, if you're going to do something like this, don't start putting a lot of features on it. Don't start doing like error checking or whatever. Because as soon as you get any of that stuff in there, uh, you're losing any performance benefits you had by going this route in the first place. And you might as well just use one of the other like protobufs or whatever that have all that stuff and have very carefully fine-tuned and, and, and improved it over the years uh, uh, rather than rolling your own. There are a few other options that you are likely to encounter if you tool around in this, uh, in this industry, in this particular corner of it for long enough. But I, I honestly wouldn't really recommend any of them. Um, thrift is something that you see. And I wrote this slide a year ago, and it's equally true today. Uh, thrift has been around for a while, but the documentation for it is really inadequate. It's the terrible docs. Uh, and the tooling basically almost just doesn't exist. Uh, you're going to have to write a lot of stuff yourself if you go with Thrift, and it's going to cause you a lot of headaches, in my experience. It does, it, it has a nice feature. You can send exceptions back over the protocol if they're like built in, and that's nice. That's useful, but I don't think they make up for the shortcomings. Another thing that you may encounter is soap. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and this is mainly uh, a counterpoint to my entire talk, because soap is terabad. It's just absolutely, absolutely horrible to work with. Uh, uh, if, if any of you have experience with it, it's, it's basically, it's this huge compendium of, of conflicting specs, and they're incredibly complicated. And, and no two implementations that I've ever used ever works together correctly. You end up just serializing everything to strings and deserializing. It's just, it's, it's, it's bad. Um, so maturity is not always the end all be all of the technology decisions because SOAP is plenty mature. All right, so, but back to happier topics. We know that we're using JSON over HTTP. The only question now is like, where do we actually send these requests? Or in other words, what is our service discovery mechanism? And I have some good news for you now because the boring option is awesome. It's DNS, yes, DNS. It's so good, you guys. Uh, Let's talk about the simplest possible scenario first. Say you just have one server per service. There's your servers, there's your services, we're done. Uh, you, just, you just point each one of these to a particular service and you really don't have to do anything else. But you can, because maybe you have multiple services, maybe you wanna do some, some waiting, maybe load balancing, whatever. If you don't have dedicated load balancers in front of like a virtual IP pool or something, which that previous example would have assumed, you can use SRV records. What are SRV records? Well, they're actually, SRV stands for service. There is a record type built into DNS specifically for services. Uh, without going into too much uh, detail, this is basically what they look like. And the interesting parts for our purposes are that you can specify the type of service there, which is any string you want. You specify what port it is served from. And you can even do like simple load balancing by specifying priorities and weights. So. Problem solved. Like this will take you into hundreds of servers and dozens of services pretty well with no additional infrastructure required whatsoever. Uh, you do need someone who knows DNS, but like that's pretty easy to come by. If you have dozens or hundreds of services, I guarantee you got a system in by now. And that guy should know DNS or girl or whoever. Uh, side note here, uh, <laughs> DNS is so good. Um, <laughs> You can put like actually a lot of other stuff into DNS. Like like there's TXT records. The TXT stands for text, which stands for anything, anything you want. Just if you can serialize it, you can stick it in a DNS record. And DNS is essentially it's a distributed high performance key value database. Redis has got nothing on DNS when it comes to performance, when it comes to uh, almost anything except for write operations. DNS is not so great at those. But when you just want to read stuff back. It's super awesome. And as an added bonus, you can do simple query response services right straight on through almost any firewall out there, um, which is good and bad. There are legitimate reasons why network engineers would like to know what's going over their network. Oh, those are like DNS queries. Oh, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, as developers, I have to say, it's super convenient. So uh, um, 
That said, there are times when you want to use something other than DNS for your service discovery. And really, I think the only time is you just got a lot of services. And a lot of servers, hundreds and hundreds. Uh, and when you have that many, service, ser when you have that many servers, uh, they're going to be going up and down. Hard drives fail. Stuff goes wrong. Uh, things are going to be dropping in and out of those pools, and you might want your service discovery to keep track of that so that it doesn't send requests to servers that are down. Um, and, and you may just be manually scaling things around. Like you, you might be like, oh, I, I see there's a usage spike over here. I need to spin up eight more of these. These are underutilized, so I'm just going to drop the, the number of those, rewrite them, use Docker. Now they're, now they're kitten servers or whatever. Um, and DNS is totally awesome, but when you have a whole lot of records, it does get pretty cumbersome to manage frequent changes to those records. In a scenario like that, Zookeeper can work for you. It is a bit of a lumbering beast of a software project. Um, again, you're going to need a dedicated person probably to maintain this. Probably maybe you could get away without it, but it's going to be somebody's job most of the time. All right, so Taterbase is, is basically working. We have all of the components that we need to successfully run a website, and let's just say that we're doing so. Um, but I have to admit, I have glossed over one or two minor decisions you may have made along the way. Like, for example, probably you got some libraries in there, maybe some gems. Those are handy. Um, so for, for many, 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 many more decisions that are likely to come, let's talk about gems. And I'm not going to go into, like, great detail on any specific gems. Instead, I'm just going to sort of cover a general strategy for looking at a gem and deciding, like, is this a stable thing? Is it reasonable for me to just shove this into my very important tater basis project? Um, so what are some questions? One is like, how long has this been around? And that won't tell you much by itself, but you can basically say if Jim was written a couple years ago uh, versus that thing I wrote last week, that couple years ago Jim is probably the safer way to go. Uh, relatedly, how widely is it actually being used? That's, these, are, these are both sort of proxies for the real question is, which is, has this thing been like road tested already? Uh, have, all the, have all the bugs come up? Am I going to find the answers when I go to Google? Have people been logging issues and fixing them? Uh, speaking of issues, how long do those issues stay open? If you look and you can see the, the team is pretty responsive with the single dev in many cases, and they're fixing the important stuff, that's a great sign. If there's some like critical bug from three months ago that's still hanging out and was totally ignored, that's not such a great sign. Uh, you can look at the, the last commit, or just generally how often do commits happen. And that will give you a, a rough idea of how active the development is. But to be fair on that point, like you don't always need to have super active development. Uh, you think of something like OmniAuth, which is this multi-purpose authentication library. It's got to keep up with every crazy thing that Twitter or Google is doing with their, with their authentication schemes. That thing needs to be actively maintained. You, you should look and you should see. I bet, I'm sure we could open it right now. It'd be mile commits just in the last week, last month. Uh, on the other hand, some gem for making IRC bots. Yeah, that's a pretty stable technology. <laughs> Not much to keep up with there, probably. So ultimately, it's, it's, it's kind of a judgment call. Really, ultimately, everything I've been talking about is a judgment call. But I, I think gems are an especially gray area. Uh, and you may be wondering, like, well, that's great, John. How do I actually find this stuff out? And the answer is Ruby Toolbox. Uh, it is a great site. It'll lay out most of the answers to most of the questions that I just posed. Um, you have to go to GitHub to see the issue tracking stuff. So in conclusion, I, I would love to continue this conversation with anybody. I seriously would. I'm a grumpy old man, and I love to yell at the kids to get off my lawn with their shiny new technologies. Um, <laughs> But if there's one thing that I really want you to take away from this talk, it's that non-standard technology choices are enormously expensive. There is a huge upfront expenditure of time and effort. And then there's a multiplier on everything else you ever do with that system. Experience and familiarity, some homegrown infrastructure, like these things can help, but they're not free. You're going to be spending a lot of time and effort on those. You are literally going to pay for this technology decision for the lifetime of that system. And I, I, think, um, I think some people see this talk and they, they, they feel like I'm being kind of a downer. They, they, they feel like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold you back. But I'm not. I'm really not. What I, what I want to do is I want, I want to set you free. I want, I want all of the incredibly exciting, bold, new, innovative ideas that you are building right now, that you are making. I want your projects to work. I want them to flow from your brain, through your fingers, out into the world, and start like, making a difference in people's lives. And I, and, I, and I don't want them to be hung up on like two months or weeks or years of waiting for some infrastructure to finish getting built and actually work. I don't want you to get 
stuck dealing with compatibility issues. I, I, I want you to be changing the world. I want you to be building stuff. I want you to be making stuff. And I want, it, I want it to just work. I want it to just work when you build it. And to do that, you have to build it on the, on the, on the stablest platform you possibly can. So if you're going to use something new and exciting, just, just make sure it's worth it. Or, or better yet, just embrace boring and be awesome. <laughs> 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 yes, Jonan. Um, so what I wanted to see if you could touch on is the um, is the trade-off that you face when you're de when you're choosing gems. For instance, I use Sinatra and I use SQL as an ORM. Mm -hmm. um, there's a gem that can interface Sinatra and SQL, or you can roll your own pretty easily. Right. And there's obviously a trade-off there in that. The gem might not be that well developed, but it might still be better developed than the findings that I can put together in research testing. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? That's, that's a great point. Um, so to repeat the question for the cameras and everything, uh, uh, and, and, and let me know if I'm paraphrasing this, this accurately, um, but it sounds like you, you, you want to know about the trade-offs mostly between using a gem that may or may not be awesome uh, versus rolling your own version of the same functionality. Is that? Mm -hmm. okay? Um, I, I will say that over the years, my, my personal inclination on that has, has shifted. I don't think that there's like a, like a this is the answer, right? Uh, I, I think in almost every situation, you, you're just going to have to kind of weigh the, the, the trade-offs. Like, how not awesome do I think it could be? Like, how, how, how not awesome could the version that I write be? And, and I, I, I feel like as time goes by, I have been more and more inclined to just say, be awesome. Like, do it yourself and be awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a great decision. Um, n now you, you, you run the risk of like the, the not invented here syndrome, right? You don't want to always go that way. But I, I, I think I've generally been more happy than not when I, when I, if I'm not pretty confident in a gem, if I'm not pretty confident in a library, there's usually a reason for that. And, and I usually come back and regret using it later. Um, and, and I think as I've gotten better at writing more stable code, I've regretted writing my own less frequently. <laughs> <laughs>